Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Praise God. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together. Welcome to uh, St. Luke's Church. And it is uh, a, a pleasure and an honor to be here with you in the presence of our God. A um, couple of uh, just quick announcements as we begin. Following the service today, sadly, the Christmas tree will be coming down, um, and uh, the, the uh, council will be doing that. But we received some messages this morning that we had a couple of council members that can't be here. So anybody that could help us would be great, especially tall people that aren't afraid of ladders um, would be awesome. And, uh, but, uh, and it shouldn't take too long. We thank you for that. I want to remind you of the Operation Christmas Child boxes. This is something that we are going to do throughout the year for the month of January. I see there are some scarf, or, um, hats and scarves and things in the boxes, but for the month of January, uh, outer clothes like that, hats, scarves, mittens, caps, uh, bandanas, mittens, gloves, all those kinds of things that you would wear on the outside, outerwear. Make sure you bring it, um, and, and, and it's going to get packed in boxes and sent off across the world um, in November, and you can already see see the date there. Um, what I like about that is nobody can say, oh, I didn't know that was happening on November 12th. You already know about it right now in January, okay? Actually, you knew about it in December, okay? So um, make sure that uh, you are doing that and bringing that and putting it in the boxes. Um, this morning, our Sunday school are waiting relatively patiently. <laughs> to sing and, uh, and share and worship and lead us in worship this morning. Next Sunday, Sunday school will meet, uh, con confirmation will meet as normal, uh, but our worship service will not be as normal. Uh, our 10 o'clock service, um, where is Amy? There you are. We'll be in here, right, uh, in the sanctuary so we can spread out a little and uh, for our annual meeting. Um, and I also need, uh, they aren't going to know this, but I need to apologize to those that normally are with us on a live stream. Um, they aren't with us, and I, I feel kind of like we're missing something. Uh, the, whole, the internet is not working right now in here. So we are recording it, and uh, we are recording it visually, and I'll get it up um, following the service, and they'll have to see it afterwards. I did shoot them off a quick note uh, online um, before I came up here and apologized to them. But I feel like somebody's missing, and, uh, and I, I miss you all. And... Uh, Will you join me in the call to worship as found in the bulletin? We read responsibly. How can we keep still this day? There is joy in this place. God's steadfast love extends to everyone. God reaches out to us all in forgiveness and compassion. Thanks to God for all the blessings we have received. Let us celebrate God's joyful love for us. We're going to do that together by singing Holy, Holy, Holy. But it's not number 20, as your bulletin says. It's number 2. And that's my fault because, I don't know, I put a zero in there after. Uh, and, and number 20 is a great song, uh, but we're going to do number two. Um, and Kathy's going to lead us in holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 
casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before he, which word and art and evermore shall be. hide thee, though the eye of sinful flesh thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in a power. join me as we go before that holy God this morning. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the many ways you offer to us your love, your presence. Help us to see the wonderful ways you work in our lives. Open our hearts and our spirits to you today. Father, we join our voices and lift before you our prayer of confession. Lord, how we must try your patience. We often doubt when we should place our faith in your presence. We think we have to have all the answers and judge others who fail to live up to our expectations. We think we are the one thing that matters most in life. Forgive us when we show how shallow our faith is. Help us to understand the miraculous ways in which you have already worked in our lives. Bring to us the light of joy and let it flood through our whole beings that we may be transformed into people of joyful service and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joyful service and faith. You know, God's love is continually poured out on all of us. And I invite each of us this morning to drink deeply from the cup of forgiveness and compassion that God offers us through Jesus Christ. Before you are seated, gathered around you, 
are those who are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, just as you are. I would invite you to greet them this morning and welcome them to the house of the Lord this morning.
was awesome. You know, in preacher school, they taught us when you don't know what to, what to do with your hands, just stick them in your pockets, you know? And, and that's, that's okay, right? But boy, do we like peace and joy and love, right? That's awesome. Hey, did a bucket show up today? Yeah. Well, uh, where is it? Hey, You're going to go get it? Oh, look at that. Do you want to join us? Anybody else would like to join us? Maybe you didn't want to, maybe you didn't sing today, but you could still come up and join us for the bucket here. Um, and we got people that aren't always here, right? And we need to let them know what this bucket's all about. Yeah, you guys can slide down if you want, don't you? Yeah. And, and we let, need to let them know uh, the bucket shows up and uh, we never know what's in it, or I never know. And uh, we open it up and see what we can learn about Jesus. And uh, it does have some rules. It can't get stink or smell. It can't, do it can't be alive. It can't. Anything to do with a snake. And... Uh, and, um, of course, the first trick is always, yeah, come on up. There you go. And we reach down, way down. Oh, my lines, it's a weight. Did you hear that? It's kind of, it's got, I bet you it has some air in it or something, right? It feels like a baggie. Is there something in the baggie? Oh, I bet. Oh. How many of you think there's nothing in this baggie? Air. How many of you think there's nothing in here? <laughs> oh, no, there is something in here, isn't there? Air. You can't see it, can you? Oh, but what's in there? Air. Air's in there, that's right. You know what? Just because we can't see something doesn't mean there's not something there, right? Huh? It's invisible. It's invisible? It is kind of invisible, isn't it? You know what? But it's still there. See? If it wasn't there, I wouldn't be able to push on the bag, would I? And, and, and so there's something in there, right? There's something that, that we can't see. It's invisible, but it's there. Did you know? There's a lot of things like that. How many of you... How many of you can see the wind? Oh, really? What do you think? How many of you can see the wind? No, we got one. Okay. All right. We see what the wind does, right? We see the wind blowing things and moving things, right? But we can't really... How many of you can see... Uh, I'm not going to do that because you can see that. But, the window? Huh? The window? Oh, uh, yeah. You know what? Sometimes in church, in Sunday school... We talk about Jesus, and we talk about God, and we talk about the Holy Spirit. Boy, those things sometimes, we can't see them, can we? But you know what? They're here. Ha. Huh. You can do that? I am so jealous, because when I do that with my shoes, nothing lights up. I am so jealous. I'm so jealous. You know what? We can see that, though, can't we? We can see that when that happens to your shoes, can't we? Yeah. We can see it happening. But we can't see what's in this bag, and sometimes we can't see Jesus. But we know what? We can see what he does. We can see that he's with us, and he makes us feel good. And he, what you guys, you younger kids, what would you sing about this morning? Peace, right? Joy? Right? Love? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That all comes from Jesus, okay? I another question. My next question is, my, my mom, mom, drunk. Yeah. But dad, and we're glad they're here. We are glad they are here. You know what? It's nice to see them, isn't it? It's nice to know they're there. And it's nice to know that Jesus is with us too. So, the next time you think you see an empty something, just know there's something actually in there. The next time you think Jesus isn't around, he is. 
And you just look for him in the way you have peace and joy and love, just like you guys sang about. And you guys sang about change my heart, oh God, didn't you? Right? You need God to do that. And sometimes he does change our heart. And we see that too. All right? You know what? Thank you for bringing us a baggie. I'm not going to open it. I'm going to give it back to you. Well, maybe I will open it. Because then it can't explode later. I won't hear a popping sound later. Will you pass that along over there? Because you might want that back. And, uh, and we won't have a bucket next Sunday, all right? But we'll have a bucket in two weeks. Would you like it? Yes. Wait, okay. Wait, last time. Wait, did I promise it to somebody? You said you'd get Henry. I thought Henry did it. Did I say Henry would get it? Yeah, you said Henry will get it, and then you'll get it. You said Henry. You see, I can't remember what I did this morning, let alone last week, okay? So that's for Henry. So Henry, I guess, is doing the bucket in two weeks. I'm excited to see what Henry dreams up for the bucket, aren't you? Can you all walk back to your parents or your grandparents or your seats and find your way there? What a great reminder that what we can't see is actually really there. And so I thank you, uh, Gavin, for that um, bag of error this morning. What a great reminder. Because in this room, what we can't see is here. We feel his power and his strength and his presence. We come before that holy God and we offer him our praise and our worship in the giving of our tithes and our offerings. pray together the prayer of dedication is found in the bulletin. Help us, dear Father, to cheerfully give to you our time, money, talents, and ourselves. Use us in the building up of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's scripture is from Psalm 35, verse 5 through 10. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice is like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take ref refuge in the shadows, shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. 
you give them drink from your river of delights. For with you, the fountain of life, in your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your, righteous, your righteousness to the upright in heart. Isn't it good to know that the righteousness and the love of God endures forever? Amen. My dad and I climbed a mountain many, many years ago. We sat on the top of a mountain in the Canadian Rockies. The trip up and down is a story for another time. But for today, I invite you to picture us sitting, eating our lunch. We were actually looking down on all of the other mountaintops as far as we could see. It was absolutely amazing. It was an incredible mountaintop experience that I will never forget. But it was nothing. It was nothing compared to the mountain top experience of all time that we call the Transfiguration. We find it in the Gospels. Today we're going to look at the Gospel account of Mark, chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It's on page 1571 in the Red Pew Bible. I would encourage you to open your Bible. We're going to take our time and follow along piece by piece. And I told somebody this week, I, I really want you to see it in the Bible, to hear God's voice, to hear his words, to read his words. We start with verse 1 of chapter 9. And it says, he, he being Jesus, said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Uh, there are, and you just got to trust me on this, there are books, volumes written about what Jesus meant in this one little verse. But I think the, uh, there's a very common view, I think it's the one that makes the most sense to me, is that Jesus is actually giving us a preview of what is coming. The chapter division, I think, is a little confusing in that. But he's giving a preview of the transfiguration that's on the way just six days later. And when we see it as a preview in the context of what's going on, it just makes a lot more sense because Jesus said some would experience the kingdom in power. So then we go to the next verse, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. This event that we call the Transfiguration is unique in history. There is nothing in any other religious writing that is anything like this. Uh, we get a little, uh, little kind of like it in the Old Testament. God appears in things like the burning bush or a, a, a pillar of fire or a cloud or in sometimes human form, but, but nothing like this. Jesus took three, P 
Peter, James, John to witness this event, this transfiguration, this changing, uh, fulfilling the prophecy, I believe there in verse 1, where he said only some, only some would witness the kingdom of God coming in power before they died. It says Jesus took them up on a high mountain. Oftentimes in Scripture, God meets with human beings on a high mountain. He met with Moses. He met with Elijah. He talked with both of them at the top of a mountain. And these three apostles, make no doubt about it, met God on a mountain. Jesus not only looked different here, but for a brief moment, he was different. He was glorified. He was changed. He was transformed. He appeared to Peter, James, and John uh, the way that he will appear when he returns again to establish his kingdom here on earth. Um, I, I, let your mind wander a little bit. It's okay. Try to imagine what they're seeing. Look at verse 3 again. His clothes, dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. His clothes dazzled. His clothes dazzled because Jesus himself, his body, was radiating the glory of God and it was shining right through the clothes. That's what these guys are seeing. And then, and then two heavenly VIPs show up. Look at verse 4. It says, and there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. I, I, whenever I read this, I wonder how they knew. Because they hadn't seen Elijah, they hadn't seen Moses. Did they have little name tags that say, hi, my name is? I, I just don't know. But somehow they knew. Obviously, Jesus told them later. But it's Elijah and Moses... But why? Why Elijah and Moses? Why not Abraham and David, Isaiah and Jeremiah? Elijah and Moses, they're only mentioned in the same, in the same um, setting in one place in the entire Old Testament. But if we go and look at that place, I think it helps us understand why it's Elijah and Moses. I'm going, to, I'm going to read it for you. It comes from Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And in the last chapter of the book of Malachi, in the last three verses of the book of Malachi, we hear this. Remember the law, this is God speaking through Malachi. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And then there was 400 years that God did not speak to the nation of Israel after that. Moses was seen as Israel's great lawgiver. Elijah was considered the greatest of the prophets by the, by the Israelites. Both spoke prophecies about Messiah and their presence at this event really kind of revealed to those three guys standing there and then to us because they told us about it that it's kind of a in Jesus a coming together Jesus becomes the focal point of everything that's happening in God's plan for all of humanity And I just, we don't, have, you know, there's not a lot of pictures done because I think it's hard for us to imagine what these apostles saw. 
They got to the top of the mountain. Jesus moved a little bit ahead of them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus just lights up. It's just, it's just radiating. And then there with him is Moses and Elijah. These three guys witnessed an incredible event. And then one of my favorite people in all the Bible, Peter, stuck his foot in his mouth. Look at verse 5, verse 6. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. One commentator that I uh, read said, uh, Peter was a man who always had something to say when there was nothing to be said. And it could be that Peter was just so overwhelmed that he just said whatever was on the top of his mind and he just blurted it out. But I believe there was a, something a little more going on. Something a little deeper. In chapter 8, Jesus had told the disciples that the Messiah must suffer, must uh, uh, die, and then resurrect. This wasn't anything like these guys had been taught by the rabbis. And then Jesus laid out the cost of following him, that they were going to experience the same thing, that they were going to uh, suffer for his sake, that they were going to have to bear their own cross, that they would be rejected by the world. And the word shelters there is the word tabernacle. And tabernacle is a word that means God with us. It's where God met with people. In the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle that traveled with the nation of Israel. Um, in the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem was a tabernacle of stone that didn't move, but it's where God met them. And in Israel, the Jews believed that in, on the day of the Lord, uh, that there would be this day that God would come and tabernacle tabernacle live with us in person and dwell with us here on earth forever and i think maybe i think maybe peter was trying to be i mean he was trying to be smart he was he was okay and i think he might have been thinking okay here's moses here's elijah and moses the lawgiver elijah who is supposed to come before messiah so here it all is. Let's forget this suffering and death stuff. Let's get to the good stuff, and let's just build the kingdom right here. Let's just do it right now. And I want you to see what happened. Jesus didn't answer him. Peter spoke to Jesus here, and Jesus didn't answer. Instead, look at verse 7. Then... A cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. What happened here is God the Father showed up. Now you talk about a mountaintop experience. Just get your head around it. You got Jesus, God the Son. You got Moses. You got Elijah. You got God the Father all in one spot. I can only imagine what those three, Peter, James, and John, were, were experiencing. The God the Father clearly identifies Jesus as his Son, he had said that at Jesus' baptism. He says it again for here for these three. And then when the Father said, listen to him, I believe with all my heart that what, what God was doing was he was saying, you three aren't listening. You think the path to the kingdom is a military victory, a throne, a crown, a national renewal of Israel. But listen to my son. First, there has to be suffering and death. And then, and then Moses and Elijah disappeared. Look at verse 8. 
says, suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Only Jesus was left. This was not by accident. This was on purpose. This whole event was designed to show Peter, James, and John something, and then to show us something. The law and the prophets revealed the way to reconnect with God and to be made right with God. That's Jesus Christ. Moses, Elijah had pointed the way, but they couldn't do any more. It was all about Jesus. They were gone. It was about Jesus. And what the guys had to, what those three guys had to wrestle with, what they had to come to terms with that day, was that everything they knew, everything they had been taught, was now, I don't know the right word, superseded, I guess, I don't know, um, overridden by Jesus. His words, his deeds. And they're left there with just Jesus. And then we know that they talked about it. Verse 9, they couldn't help but talk about it. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Why? Why would Jesus tell them not to tell anybody about this? I mean, this was an incredible event. But the truth of the matter was, these guys didn't understand what the event was all about yet. And if Jesus would have let them speak about it, they would have been speaking about the wrong things. They would have been speaking about, oh man, we saw Jesus all lit up in glory, and we saw Moses and Elijah, and it was awesome. And they would skip all the suffering and all of the death and all of the resurrection stuff that Jesus was trying to teach them. They saw a future kind of look at the glory of Jesus, and they got that, but they didn't want all that stuff in between. And it turns out they, they obeyed Jesus. They didn't, they didn't tell anybody about it until after he was resurrected. But look at verse 10. It says, They kept the matter to themselves discussing what rising from the dead meant. Jesus had uh, told these three to keep it quiet. They did. But they talked about what does rising from the dead mean? From the Old Testament, the, the Jews believed that there, on the day of the Lord there would be this general resurrection of the, of the dead. But what in the world what was Jesus talking about when he talked about the Son of Man had to be resurrected from the dead? They didn't get that. And so, in verse 11, uh, they asked Jesus. They asked Jesus a question. They said, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah does come first, restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. They have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. They understood the words of Malachi. They understood that Elijah had to come before the Messiah. So if Jesus was the Messiah, where was Elijah? I mean, he'd been there, but now he left. He'd been right there on the top of the mountain, but he disappeared. And Jesus eventually answered their question, but first he asked them a question. And essentially what he asked them was, what do you make of all the scriptures that talk about a suffering Messiah? They're there. You just don't want to see them. You're reading the parts you like, but, but there's scriptures that clearly speak about a, a Messiah suffering and being mistreated. Isaiah 52, 53, many of the Psalms. This is an issue, by the way, that, that Jews still wrestle with today because they can't get their heads around the idea of a, of a suffering Messiah. Messiah. 
So finally he did answer them. And he said, look, their question about Elijah, he said, guess what? Elijah has come. And they did what they wanted to do to him. And that was John the Baptist. How do we know it was John the Baptist? Because when John, before John the Baptist was born, an angel appeared to John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah, and said that John would go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Malachi's prophecy had already been fulfilled. The Messiah was here now. Jesus was the Son of God, but he had to suffer, he had to die, and he had to rise from the dead. In this event, Jesus couldn't be more clearer for the guys. He couldn't be more clearer for us. So, part of my job is to tell you what Scripture says, help you understand what it means, but then to answer the question, so what? Because so far this morning, it's just been information. That's kind of cool if you're a geek like me. But so what? In the transformation, God the Father makes it very clear Jesus is the Son of God, which we know from the Old Testament is a term that means he is God. He is part of what we call the Trinity. Now, I don't understand totally the Trinity. You don't understand totally the Trinity. Anybody who tells you they understand the Trinity, I would question anything they say after that. I just know it's true. And what God wants us to know today from this event, if you give your life to Jesus, it means some suffering. It means rejection. But it will also mean there is glory ahead for anyone who trusts in Jesus. Jesus came to die on a cross to bear the curse so that we could be blessed by God. And he provided it before we even knew we needed it. Long before we, needed, we knew we needed grace, God provided grace. Long before we, we knew we needed mercy, God provided mercy. And when we go to God and, and we ask him to, to please don't give me what I deserve, that's mercy. God says, my child, I've already given you that. That's what the cross is all about. God paying our sin debt before we ever knew we were in trouble. And there's something else. In this event on a mountain, we get a glimpse of glory for each of us. If we're honest, following in the footsteps of Jesus is not easy. But it's worth it. We want to skip the suffering part. We want to skip the difficult stuff and jump right to the glory. And the glory will come. When we are resurrected, we'll trade these old worn out bodies for a new model a glorified one like the one that Jesus displayed that day like the one that Jesus has today in glory and like the one that he will come back with one that'll never sin one that'll never get sick it'll never get old it'll never get frail it'll never experience grief best of all it will never die and it's then when we get that body that we will look back and we will say, this was all worth it. But you know what? We live in a I want it all and I want it all now society. And God says, you already have it all. You just need to wait. And we don't like that word, wait. 
Okay, I don't like that word, wait, okay? I don't know about the rest of you. We don't like that word. But God says you already got it. It's all yours. Just wait. I was telling the confirmation class this morning. You know, when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead, remember saying that in the Apostles' Creed? We get to choose right now which side we get judged on. We don't have to wonder. God says you can have it now. You can know now. Because Jesus is coming back in that glorified body and he's going to judge us and we get to choose now which side we want to be on, what side we want to go, the glorified way or the unglorified way. One last thing. One last thing. Having mountaintop spiritual experiences is not a sign of spiritual maturity. There's a lot of people in our world today that are seeking mountaintop spiritual experiences. I want you to hear me very carefully on this. There's nothing wrong with those. I've had a few in my lifetime. Some of you have as well. They are good. They are wonderful. But the, the apostles here, they had the most incredible, awesome mountaintop experience spiritually ever that anybody has ever had. God, the Father, God, the Son, Moses, Elijah, all in one place. They got to see it. They got to experience it, and they didn't get it. They didn't get it up on the mountain. They didn't get it down, on the, uh, down below when they came down below. They didn't understand it until after the resurrection. And the truth is they did not need that mountaintop experience. What they needed is exactly what God the Father told them. Listen to Jesus. And the same is true for us. I've known people that search desperately for one mountaintop experience to the other when their spiritual walk. But the truth is, we live in valleys. Now we got joys, we got happiness, but we live in valleys. And what we need most, what will change us, is not really the mountaintop experiences. What will change us is the words of Jesus given to us in the Word of God, found in the everyday life that we live as Jesus speaks into our lives. But like air in a baggie, it's tough to see. In fact, most of us got so much going on in our lives, we can't hear it. And we're so busy, and we got so much going on. I, I, I think Jesus could be standing there screaming at our face, and we'd go, sorry, I got things I got to do. And what the transfiguration shows us is that God wants us to listen to Jesus. So I'm left with a question. For myself, for each of you, are you ready? Are you ready to listen to Jesus? There's a hymn that I grew up singing. Be Thou My Vision. We're going to sing it in just a few moments. It's a wonderful, beautiful hymn that asking, asking for God, for Jesus to, 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 to show us the way. But in order for to, uh, him to do that, 
we have to be willing to listen. And as someone who struggles with hearing, listening is not always easy. And sometimes we have to really work at it. So I ask you to ask yourself, are you willing to do what it takes to listen to Jesus? Kathy, would you lead us? In hymn number 532, as we ask that Jesus to be our vision and speak to us today. Son, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of As a reminder, there is fellowship time today downstairs. I would encourage you to come and share with each other around the tables. And then next Sunday, we will meet at 10 o'clock here in this room for our annual meeting. And now, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to him be honor glory, and eternal dominion. Amen. <laughs>